All good. Good morning and welcome everyone and I'll officially open the Planning and Environment Committee meeting for the month of July in the year 2020 and pay our respects for uh, the traditional owners of this country, uh, past, present and emerging. Um, we have four items on the agenda and uh, we have a range of staff and I do ask the staff um, when your item uh, is there, you could come up uh, to the front so we can see you and talk to you on the camera and uh, particularly the case for the acting uh, director of uh, planning and sustainability and sustainability and environment mr alan hazel i have a whole lot of complicated planning questions to ask you <laughs> so we move to item one so item one is a report to staff on representation on climate emergency australia strategic advisory group we're just waiting for Rebecca's of her report. I think she's dialing in, but uh, it's not here yet for some reason. Do we wish to hold that item over to the last item on the agenda? Ah, it's up to you. Ah, here she is. I'll um, let her in the room. Just hang on. Brett is letting her into the room. <laughs> so, good morning, Rebecca. Can you hear us? Um, Just connecting. connecting. How's it going? It helps pretty bad. Right. Okay, so does anyone have any questions of staff they wish to inquire about on this item? The council is going to need to nominate one of you to um, represent Queensland on the on the group. No matter of which council is uh, interested or how you want to address that. Sure. Well. I'm happy to put the name forward if no one else is interested, but I'm also happy if other people are keen. Okay. Uh, the nominations? I would like to, very much so. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm interested also. I'm just wondering how committed do we have to be to these uh, meetings? How often are they happening? Yeah, Rebecca, do you know how much about the frequency of the meetings? Um, how often they're going to occur or when they're going to occur? Yeah, probably once a month or once every two months. Uh, just in the initial first year, and then from there, determining whether you know how how the frequency might need to be changed, but it's a it fairly low commitment initially. Thanks, Rebecca. And is there any particular background knowledge that you would prefer the person sitting on this position possesses? No, I don't think so. It would be helpful to have a, a general understanding of the climate change issues as it affects local government. But, but otherwise, no. Thank you. Rebecca, are those meetings, they'll be held online, I assume? They'll be online. Yep. So, we've got two or three people interested. I'm quite happy for anyone to, put their, to, to be involved. Is there a mechanism? If oh, there's Amelia? A... I'm interested also. So I suggest we better send this one to the general committee. Yeah, I think all the councils will need to yeah. out who's Can, who's I, can I just ask a question about yeah. it? Um, it just says under page four, there are no immediate or long-term financial implications on council to join the advisory group. Um, but then on page seven, it says um, the CEA, Climate Emergency Australia, will be funded by founding funders. Councils who seek the benefit in working together with other councils acknowledge this needs resources to get started, can afford to contribute, and are willing to provide funding to receive mutual benefits that coordinating this work together brings rather than a direct return to themselves. So is there any financial, they seem to be at sort of polar opposites, those two. Is there any um, financial implications or contributions that this council need to make to this group? Yeah, I can answer that. Thanks, in, the initial, in the initial formation of the group, um, there was a request that councils put forward 
funding towards the establishment of it and also for the appointment of a project officer that could coordinate um, the committee. Uh, this council didn't put any funding towards that, but several others down in Victoria did, they had the capacity to do that and were able to fund the project officer. And what about ongoing costs, Rebecca? Uh, it would all. It would only be um, at the council's discretion, um, but we haven't made any commitment. Uh, this council hasn't made any commitment towards funding of it. Okay. Uh, so okay. ours would just be um, our in-kind support and our nomination of a Queensland representative. That would be our contribution. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So. Someone like to move and go to general committee, and we'll see if we can fine tune who might be. Sure, I'm happy to move that. Move to Councillor Finzel, okay. seconded yes. Councillor Wigner. All in favour? Carried unanimously. So we move on to uh, item two, which is a material change use for a minor change to development approval for commercial business type one, um, office commercial business type two, medical and ancillary dwelling unit, and reconfiguration of a lot. Access easement at 36 and 40 Hoffman Drive, Nooseville. Um, it all seems fairly straightforward. Is there anything you'd like to overview in terms of getting to understand the change? Um, I think it's important just to understand that this is a very large building. Um, the councillors were here when it was first approved. Um, uh, were advised that it's three storeys, whereas the scheme actually seeks two storeys in part. So that is an important element to note about this building, it's a large one. At the time, um, officers and council agreed that it was, it was the right um, approach for this site um, to encourage the medical centre, but also because the third floor was a reduced floor um, and also quite a good design um, with the project. Um, so this addition you know, they're seeking to cover um, the rear car park does add to a little bit more building bulk to the building, um, but being at the rear, uh, officers are comfortable that it, it won't look out of place uh, in, the, in the business centre. So, I've got a question, Kerry. How do you reconcile allowing this to be three storeys where, say, as an example, the, the development of Pridgian who want to put a roof terrace on, two storeys and a roof terrace aren't allowed. How do we reconcile those differences? Yeah, well, going forward, the new planning scheme seeks a mix of heights in the business centre to you know, allow a little bit more development and, um, in, in the centre, um, recognising that it's our key business centre for the Shire. Um, so, uh, and it's also about whether it's um, out of character with the surrounding area. So it's right adjacent to industrial development, which, which is allowed to go to 10 metre five, so quite, quite high already, uh, with you know, a concrete stack in behind. Parts of Noosa Civic are at 16 metres already, so it's not out of character with you know, sort of the surrounding landscape. Whereas Prigian Village was all two storeys, um, eight metres, um, and it was quite consistent through Prigian, that height, there wasn't, you don't find anything higher generally in that area. So um, it's about keeping buildings consistent with the character of what's existing and what's, um, what's planned for the area as well. Okay, thank you. Other questions? I just wonder whether it's a practical condition in that uh, council Stockwell should never need the medical veneer accelerator. <laughs> <laughs> Would that work? Yeah. We can try. For those who haven't read the report, you say radiation treatment for cancer. It's a bunker that's mainly below ground, so it doesn't pose any risk to those around it and hopefully has a desired result for those inside it. Okay, would someone like to move the staff recommendation? Move Council Wagner and a seconder. Uh, Council Stewart, all in favour? Carried unanimously. We move on to item three. Now, Thanks, this sir. item has been asked to be referred to the General Committee, but uh, if there's questions of staff uh, or, or issues that um, you would like addressed before it goes, um, now's the time to do it. Do we have questions? I'll start off with a, um, a major, a pen, a dandy, um, 
Firstly, the, the project plan reads really well. The monitoring evaluation component is the best I've seen in the report come to council in the last five years, which is well done. And my only suggestion is that in your project plan, you use a term in a way that it's not, not used in your monitoring evaluation plan. That is, your column, which is entitled measurable outcomes, is 95% measurable outputs. Whereas outcomes in your monetary evaluation plan are correctly defined. Um, you, and I suppose that to me is um, a key to monetary evaluation. We're not just going to measure what we've done. We want to measure whether the outcomes of doing it have been achieved. And, and, the, and you know, the diagram, I think it's figure five, which is a very useful diagram. And then the impact of those outcomes on the broader environment. So that's my only suggestion is have a look at your title of the, the column that says measurable outcome. Because I think if you look at your um, at your figure five for monitoring evaluation, they're not actually outcomes; they're outputs. Thank you, Councillor. Take it on those. Other questions? Is there anything that people would like to know more about before Monday? There, yeah, probably the question: Is there any more information you'll need before Monday? And uh, from the staff. Um, the names uh, for the technical advisory group, the New South Shire Council of uh, Environmental Services Manager, I just assume that that's Craig Doolin? That is. Correct, Craig, yep. yeah. And then from the Nature Conser Conservancy, the project manager is Craig Bohm? Correct. Correct. Yeah, Craig, yeah, there you are. <laughs> that's okay. okay. And then for so the Nature Conservancy, the, the other names, I'd just like to know the names of the people um, there for that, the, met, the um, operations manager, monitoring manager, uh, from the Nature Conservancy, and maybe they're not set yet, but no. I always like to put names to positions. Thank you, they are set. We tend to just refer to the titles in place so people change within the organisation and we don't need to read them, redo the documentation. But we have Chris Gillies, who's the overall manager. Mm -hmm. um, he won't be at the tag, but he does oversee in the background along with Kim Rawlings from Council. We have um, Simon Brannigan, who's on the tag, who's my direct line manager and he's um, the experienced operational side of the organisation. And then we have our monitoring and evaluation manager, another Simon, which is nice and easy, Simon Reeves as well from PNC. So, Councillor, would you like me to have them noted into the plan or? That, I, would, yes, I would love that, yeah, please, yeah. Um, I, I have a question. I, I've been given a huge amount. Thank you very much, Craig. You've sent me a huge amount of information. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. And it's for me to read through this weekend. Whereabouts would I go to find the exact um, assessment of prawn and fish stock <coughs> in the river now, currently? What, 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 what um, piece of information, or, or out of all those documents that I've been given, where, where specifically would that be found? There's a couple of, well, they're found in a couple of different places. Yeah. Um, with regards to the fish stocks, um, the fishing commercial fishing report that Council had undertaken last year will have the most up-to-date commercial fisheries catch for the last five years. That was the Fishing Futures paper. Okay. Um, that quite happily tacks on exactly where the Ruth Thurston report finished. She has historical data going back to the 1950s prior to that on commercial fishing catch. Yep. Um, so that'll bring you essentially up-to-date with the fishing data. Um, yep. The prawn data historically is also included within that Ruth, Ruth Thurston report. Um, and there's more detailed prawn data also as part of the University of Sunshine Coast study final report um, as well. So the Fishing Futures paper yep. and the Thurston report and the USC report are the three go-tos. That, that would be the key elements. Okay, yes. thank you, Craig. And Craig, question, does that include, uh, there was mention that there wasn't a sufficient numbers of commercial fishing boats? to obtain some information. Mm -hmm. Can you just clarify what that was? Um, with regards to the general reporting, you can pull off the website. If there's fewer than five boats fishing a particular area, they don't put all the data on the website because it's not considered private under privacy conditions because it can look too easily in, uh, identify individual fishers. The Fishing Futures report has that data, so it has all the data from the uh, fishing boats. Collated, obviously, so you can't identify individual fishermen's catch, uh, but that has all the data. Um, up to 2018, I think is the most recent data there. And in, re in regard to that information, mm. Craig, which I'll, I'll go back and I'll mm. look at that. Thank you for showing me that because uh, there's a lot of stuff there's, to, there's a lot, there's a lot yeah. to read through, but I'll, yeah. be, I'll be sure to go to those three first. Yeah. Whereabouts is it in the measurable, the measurables or the measurable outcomes? 
that we're, we, if you've given, we've got the baseline, mm -hmm. that we're seeing that actually improve. Where are the measurable outcomes? What specific outcomes are they um, that we can see that that, that that baseline is improving? Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of ways. Um, within the actual monitoring report and the goals. In, in the contract specifically. Sorry? In the contract specifically. In which, the con which measurable outcomes state that those, do you know that? I don't have the contract on me. I'm just well, no, I, I do. Um, the details are in the project management plan, which has been provided as part of this meeting, the yeah. contract itself doesn't have the baselines or details of the monitoring that will be undertaken um, as part of the project. That's included in the project management plan, which is included here. So the contract basically refers to the project management plan to provide those details. And if you have a look at the project management plan, some of the um, Goals three and four um, start to outline how there'll be measurements within the demonstrate the creation of habitat to benefit fish and the demonstrate the construction of the reef enhances marine biodiversity. So there's two areas of monitoring that will be undertaken as part of the project before and after. And that also um, includes some further work being undertaken by council at the moment as part of the environment strategy to look at re recreation of fish catch, which will look at surveys of uh, fishes coming in that'll start prior to the implementation of the first reef. Um, that sits a little bit separate to this project, but obviously relates with it quite closely. Um, so that's a separate piece of work. That'll provide baseline, not specifically on the oyster reefs, because it'll look at a whole range of projects and initiatives we've got going on in the river. Whereas the stuff on the implementation plan is very much focused around where the reefs are being placed. I understand the monitoring component. Mm. I guess my question is, if we're starting at a baseline and I've got no idea about sulfites or nitrogen or, NF or oxygen in the waters, if we're starting at say five, how do we know that this this project is we're, we're getting to ten? Okay. How, how do we know that those deliverables we're achieving, not just monitoring? How do we actually how we measured them today, and in three months they're here, and in six months they're here, and in twelve months they're here? How, how, where whereabouts in the contract is is that? Um, the, the areas I just identified within the project That's monitoring plan, though, isn't it? Would is, well, that would be the purpose of the monitoring, to identify the situation, the ecological situation prior to the installation of the reefs, during and post the installation of the reefs at those locations. Yeah. So, so the, the KPIs are to do with monitoring. What about the outcomes or the evaluation of that? Is, is that all to do with the KPIs as well? Yeah, I, I don't know that I'm totally clear on your question, sorry. Sorry, well, there's a lot of monitor, like just yeah. from where I'm seeing, there's a lot of measurables and, mm -hmm. and monitoring. I just, where's the specifics? That's all I'm asking. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have the, Craig may be able to offer a little bit more information, but um, the project plan identifies what will be monitored before and after the project. Um, the exact methodology, I can't answer to that at this stage. So is that something that we could get a little bit more uh, understanding of by Monday? Yeah, certainly. certainly Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I did have one other, and that was um, in, and this is something you have to think about on for Monday too, it's page 14, and it's the objective for community engagement, and it reads, strengthen community interest, support and participation in Noosa River restoration by establishing community volunteer programs to support oyster restoration. So it's focused on the participation. Um, I would have thought it might be important to include something around uh, strength and community understanding. There's nothing in there that talks about capacity building, that uh, this project should build an, both an understanding of and not just be involved in, but the need for. And maybe there's some tweaking of the words around there that we could have a look at too, and maybe it's captured somewhere else, but that's where I saw it. So it's just that part of this process is not just about getting it involved, but it's understanding why it's needed and, yeah. What might be yeah, capacity building more broadly on that moment the community in terms of why this this project is so important for uh, ongoing river health and catching more fish in the future? Councillor, I appreciate that actually. I would be very happy to include more words along the broader context of community involvement and engagement. Um, certainly, this is quite, a, as I've said in the paper, a surgical project. We have to put fairly small structures in amongst a raft of existing uses. And our work in, in some of the other states and in, in the US and now into Europe, these projects usually work over very large areas and we can have lots of people come and be involved. We don't have the space in Noosa to work at that sort of direct participatory scale, but we can involve people through associated projects, awareness projects, 
um, drawing murals, art projects, various things that celebrate the river, its health, our uses, our love of it, that we tie to the project and build that understanding and awareness, which I've actually just had a very early morning phone up with Florida to discuss options for doing that, which I think is, is as important, if not more important, than people directly getting out there measuring oysters or, or shucking or you know, washing things, which is quite hard labour, and most people don't really want to do that anyway, to be fair. Yeah, cancer jokes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they are I've got, willing... I've got chills. But they are interested in other sort of connections to the project and, and what it's trying to achieve more broadly. So I'm very happy to broaden out that scope a little bit because we'll be doing it anyway, but I'd like to see it better captured. So thank you, Councillor. Yeah, I ordered that say as well with the volunteers, you know, there's one, there's an opportunity for citizen science with the reefs, you know, as actually measurable outcomes further down with, you know, the, the fish catches and so forth, as with the little micro reefs that were already in there. The, the cameras said that two to three times more of the big game fish were around those reefs than before. Um, so that, I think that's an opportunity for citizen science as well as the cleaning of the oysters. I mean, I, to be honest, I get, I was very excited about doing my civic duty and eating war oysters and then <laughs> cleaning them, but but then being a part of the process. And I, I was envisioning, you know, at times where there'd be a group of people cleaning oysters and talking about, you know, the, the importance of this and the success that it's done and then the science of how the these shells will be put together through the, the process of filtering the water, taking the dirt and sediments out of the water and creating that cement base that's mm -hmm. underneath the oysters. So yeah, that I I thought that was exciting, but I think that that could be expanded on as well. Certainly. Question: um, Can you just for the people that don't know, uh, who will own the research data? It'll go to the public commons, as far as I understand. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's no intellectual property attached to either party. All, all research data will be uh, publicly available. Mm. And who are the three parties involved in the, the project? It's what the MBRF. No, there's two parties involved in this project, Noosa Council and the Nature Conservancy. Different groups have been involved in the earlier stages of scoping it, okay. uh, but there's only two people, party, two organisations party to the current agreement, and that's Council and the Nature Conservancy. Council and the Nature Conservancy. Yeah. I mean, in, in the lead up four or five years, NBRF, University of Sunshine Coast, University of Queensland, Noosa Parks, a whole range of organisations have been involved in getting it this far. Okay, thank you. When we talk about baseline data, um, there was discussion the other day at the briefing that we had talking about uh, what are the baseline milestones and is there a plan to lead into a green infrastructure plan? How does that work? That was mentioned at the meeting. There's not a plan at this stage as part of this. I mean, what we're doing is green infrastructure, um, but at this stage there's no push for council as a whole to move into a broader green infrastructure plan. I think at that meeting, that was a discussion at a read, I think a South East Queensland level, looking at a green infrastructure plan. Um, I, to be honest, I don't know a lot more about it other than what was discussed at that meeting, but it's certainly not um, an area we're going with council at this stage, but it may be future direction. Um, if we have really successful installation of the first stage of the oyster reefs, that we look at something, you know, a more broader, more broader program. Thank you. Um, I do have another question. In the measurable outcomes on page 31 of 40 of this agenda item, mm -hmm. uh, there's evidence of Carby Carby involvement in the tag. Mm -hmm. um, can you just explain that? Uh, yeah, it, it was identified early on uh, that Carby Carby should be involved in the technical advisory group. I'd have a lot to add. Um, so a position within the technical advisory group was reserved for a Carby Carby representative. Mm -hmm. At this stage, the, car, uh, the technical advisory groups only met once and the Carby Carby representative was un unable to attend on that day. So they haven't attended yet. Okay. Well, I add to the, um, the recent historic study of oyster reefs and with the ecosystems in South East Queensland, led by Thurston with TNC, there was a lot of Carby Carby involvement in the compilation of the data for that report too, which was one of the baseline reports. So okay. they've been involved in the preliminary stages, mm -hmm. but we do wish them want to be actively involved yeah. for whatever their capacity is throughout the project. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. So Thank question, you. are you satisfied then that um, that the milestones with their involvement has been met? Well, I can answer that. No, it hasn't to this point, but that's part of the second stage of payments, which is four to six months away. So. Um, that'll be, that's one of the conditions that need to be met to meet the second milestone along with a range of others. And 
that's a, that was it's at least four to six months away. So I would have expected us to have two to three more tag meetings at least, where I would have expected Carpi Carpi representation. Um, if we were deciding today whether or not that milestone met, I'd say no, it hasn't. Mm -hmm. But there's they've certainly been engaged, they're involved, and we fully expect them to, mm -hmm. to be involved in the project. So just to clarify, mm -hmm. milestones have to be met before money moves on. To that, the next phase that, that's correct. So the first payment was made upon signing of the agreement. Um, the second payment is made upon the completion of, I think, five further milestones. The pre presentation of this project plan to council is one of those milestones. Uh, other two are um, the amount of media reporting, the amount, uh, the involvement of Carby Carby, and also the delivery of uh, state permits. So there's still a few steps to be made before that second payment's made. So it would be fair to say that these are more tasks, wouldn't it, Craig, than milestones, would you suggest? <coughs> oh. I mean, ta I mean... I mean, a milestone to me is that we've achieved, you know, we can see improvement or we have measurable outcomes. These, these are evidence these are, of these carbon These preliminary carbon. type issues we have to get yeah. before yeah. we get to that. But yeah, they're, they're more tasks, these well, measurable outcomes. Well, I, I guess if you look at something like completed state permitting, that could be considered a task or a milestone because either way, it's something that needs to be reached in order to progress um, the project further. Um, I mean, obviously, the, uh, the agreement is just that. It's an agreement between two parties. Um, so milestones are put in place um, on what I guess we saw as particular risk areas that the council had very key interest in having Carby Carby involvement in ensuring that the state permits were met. So we decided to delay those payments until we were certain that those criteria could be achieved. So um, just back to the Carby Carby, it was interesting to see in the cultural plan those councils are interested in understanding a little bit more and don't want to read a lot, there's a uh, hyperlink to the little video that the Heritage Coordinator has done looking at Kabi Kabi and the oysters around here, which I read I watched it last night, very good. Um, in terms of milestones and outcomes, I think that is uh, a fairly standard practice, that when you contract someone to do a job that you call the completion of certain tasks to get your milestone for payment. That's just standard contracting procedure. It is, the, it is not linked generally to the monitoring evaluation of the impact of the undertaking of those tasks, which as I said in this case, is fairly well, well very well documented in a, a comprehensive monitoring evaluation plan. So. Brian, just uh, sorry, oh. a quick question. Who's, who's the actual Carby Carby rep for Brian? Um, I think it's Kerry. Kerry Jones. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, Kerry was, yep. Yep. and um, he was one in the video. It was, yeah. So that, that request came through. And he hasn't worked in the Ridge River many years ago. Yeah, and and well, I don't have the quote in front of me, but in the first and uh, report, I don't know if it's from Kerry. Very strong support from Carby Carby for Easter Restoration in this river. I saw it as a key cultural activity. When we had our, our weekend camp up the North Shore, we certainly had one of the other. Uh, would be young? Yeah. Tell us uh, all about if they're interested. Um, Councillor Drivik, you had a query? Look, I'm, I guess I'm following on, and I'm, I'm seeing whether I'm on the same mindset with what the, uh, the Mayor is, uh, the question the Mayor's raised, and that's um, how do we measure success of this uh, project going forward, and can it be done numerically? You know, is there a, a number that we're trying to achieve of, of, of species increase, or a, a number of, I mean, you can't go out and count the number of fish in the river, clearly, that are there and, and at, the, at the end of it, but um, I would imagine that. Um, there must be some measure more than anecdotal of an increase in species and or, or numbers of fish at the end of this project. There's the, the, the project management plan identifies a couple of clear goals on that and we'll come to the meeting on Monday with some more specific details around what that might look like because it's been done on a whole range of other projects all around the world. Um, so we'll just come a bit more prepared for that Monday meeting. Because I think that's what I was heading to. I know that there, there are other projects around the world that, that we, we, we base this on. I mean, they've had measures of success that uh, I'm wondering whether we can, you know, yeah. well, parallel to, uh, to to the levels that they, that they have achieved. Well, we already have some examples with the University of Sunshine Coast work where they have very clear measures of success of increased fish numbers um, around the experimental units they had in the river at the time. I'll just ask me, is that, is that along the lines of what you were sort yeah, of aiming um, towards? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. I, think I think way. it would provide a lot of more comfort if there mm. was a baseline that we started with. You can't tell a swimmer, I mean, Dr Gilly said the other day, we know we're improving, but mm. you can't say to a swimmer, your times mm. are getting better unless you've got a base time. Yeah. So we can't know that this, this project, that things are getting better and this is working mm. unless we've got a baseline. Yep. And that's what we need. Mm. And further to that, I think, 
not only what constitutes success, but what constitutes failure. And in the latter, um, what's council's position? What happens if the project fails? Um, do we have any recourse as a council? Can we seek compensation? Mm -hmm. This is uh, a project that's been heavily invested in, and I, and I think they're serious considerations. Yeah, it's a material breach, failure to meet the KPIs. I mean, these are the questions that we need sort of to know. Okay. Yes, I would, I would um, recommend to councillors, we haven't had the opportunity, the monitoring evaluation report in 2022 answers a lot of these questions that I said, and I'll repeat it. It is the best monitoring evaluation plan of any project that I've seen coming for this council in the last five years. Which but it doesn't talk about the contractual terms, though, does it, council stuff? It talks about what you're talking about. That's what I say. The contractual the terms breach. are separate in the contract, and the monitoring evaluation plan is about assessing the how it is moving towards both the objectives and the goals in a very scientific, methodical way, as you'd expect from an ecological restoration uh, unit that is uh, world class. Can I ask one further question, um, Craig? Um, you might be able to answer this. Um, as a council, have we looked at the ongoing cost of maintenance of the reef oyster um, project? And if we have, who's going to be funding that? Um, no, we have, well, there's been consideration to it. We don't know exactly what it's going to be. Um, the intent is that the oyster reefs, once, once they're implemented into the river, will require very little maintenance. Um, exactly what that looks like. We probably won't have a clear idea until we know exactly what, um, I guess, the oyster reefs look like, exactly what sort of structures are being used. So uh, this intent is not expected to be a major cost because they won't be large physical structures. They're simply a change in the, I guess, the floor um, of the river. Um, so we're not expecting any significant costs, but do we know exactly what they'll be? No, we don't. We won't know until we know exactly where the reefs are and what they're made of. Um, okay. uh, sorry, my last question is, um, I note somewhere in the papers that I read so many over the weekend um, that there was a requirement um, for the project manager to be a marine biologist mm -hmm. and have extensive um, coastal and management style experience and I googled Craig um, and under the Nature Conservancy, tick extensive, commendable, reputable experience, but I didn't see anywhere whether you're a marine biologist. No, I'm not a marine biologist. I'm actually um, a two degree coastal manager um, with experience in marine biology and ecology and fisheries management. And that's why TNC chose me because of my multiple backgrounds relevant to marine ecosystem management. So I understand the multiple players. Um, as a marine biologist, that would tick some of the boxes, but it's sort of under perhaps undersells what's required for these jobs, which are very complicated. Um, you need to do the marine biology and understand it, but also understand the ecology, as well as the stakeholders, as well as the fisheries management, as well as the legislative frameworks. And um, when TNC was scoping for this position, trying to find somebody, they look at the best mix of skills and they chose me for whatever reason. Um, and. Uh, yeah, and so, I mean, they could have chosen a pure marine biologist, but they may have come out of an institution where they did not have this broad experience, which has kind of seemed to them to be more fitting than just having straight marine biology as the background. So, yeah. What you're saying is that your experience is more in integrated coastal management, and that's what this project brings in. Well, that's what TNC decided was not more relevant, and with council's support, as far as I understand. Mm -hmm. That's for. Um, you got cells to decide, not for me, as a new humble servant of the people now. So, yeah. <laughs> All good. Um, one, sorry, Joe, one more question. I'm going back I'll to... point of order. Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Excuse me. No, 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 you called me Joe. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, sorry. They're both um, their haircuts. It's easier to get them. <laughs> Just back to um, the Gubby Gubbies, and I, I sent you uh, some questions yesterday, yep. Craig. Um, again, I'm a little bit confused. So mm -hmm. I've sort of read that um, a, a milestone was evidence of Gubby Gubby involvement. Yep. And to date, and, and thank you for your explanation, mm -hmm. that it was for operational reasons, as I've understood, mm -hmm. that um, you went ahead with the MEG team and the Gubby Gubby just weren't able to turn up. That's correct, yep. um, 
I noticed some of the membership it said TBC, which mm -hmm. is to be confirmed, and my understanding of to be confirmed is that there is no certainty. Um, it's not known yet who that representative is going to be. I also note in the report that you mention um, we are hopeful um, of the Gubby Gubbies being represented at the next meeting. There's a lot of uncertainty in those mm -hmm. words, so I'm throwing back at you, can you provide some hard evidence that um, there will be real representation on the tag as required under the milestone, um, which then will allow us to discharge um, you know, financially equip you guys of that milestone and allow the next payment. I'm still not, I haven't got my head around the certainty of the Garvey Garvey uh, involvement. So the, the, the correspondence between uh, Kim Rawlins and I believe Brian Warner within Garvey Garvey has been that they are very keen to be involved and were just unable to make it on that day. Uh, and they've nominated a representative, I believe, Kerry Jones. So it is um, Kerry. Yeah, but I believe so. Um, I'll have to confirm with Kim Rawlins who doesn't return from leave till tomorrow. Uh, but uh, I believe that's the case and we're, we're expecting them to attend. Uh, and also, to repeat the answer to Councillor Finzel's question, um, it is a milestone that doesn't need to have been met as of today because we won't be making that payment for a period. But we have very strong indication from Carby Carby that they want to be involved. They've been strong supporters of the project. They're very big, they're on record of being very, thinking oyster restoration in the river is very important um, for the river generally and also for their cultural interests in the river. So, um, we have a lot of faith they'll be there, but because it is a milestone, if in four to six months we're sitting here looking at those milestones for payment and they haven't been involved, then that will be an issue. Uh, but okay. everything I see at the moment suggests they're very keen to be involved. Okay, so let me understand if I've read correctly. Um, I think under the terms of reference, um, under the roles and responsibilities yep. of technical advisory group mm -hmm. members, that they are required to attend all meetings mm -hmm. um, in person, or electronically or in proxy, some the wording to, to that effect. So um, we're saying there is an exemption then with the Gabi Gabi representatives? No, I, I think that's um, probably... I'm going to stand in. Um, yeah. mm. I believe if mm. councillors understood the situation that they wouldn't be asking these questions, so I'm going to say can we hold this off for Monday? Sure. And uh, we'll go from there. Okay, that sounds reasonable in the circumstances. Okay. Just well, one last question. The river plan, we're going to be looking at the river plan coming up real soon. Um, could you just give a rough thumbnail in, uh, overview of how the oyster project here fits in with the river plan and the language in the river plan that's going to reflect this, the oyster project? Um, perhaps I could take that one on notice for Monday. Tom, I hadn't really cons put, uh, put my head in that direction. Look, certainly the, the river plan as it is um, certainly sees the oyster reef reconstruction as um, a key element um, in improving basically I guess, natural infrastructure in the river moving forward. Um, there are specific objectives in the plan, but I can't recall the wording of them off the top of my head, um, which the oyster reef fits quite neatly into. So um, if I could perhaps ask me to get on Monday, I'll come with a more detailed answer for you if that's okay. I've got one last question, yes. it's a pretty easy one. I think it's 13A, measurable outcomes, and so I don't have a contract on me. Yep. Um, where is, is it obtained state licenses? It is, yes. Yeah, yep. where, where are we with that? Um, only in the early stages. Um, one of the purposes of the technical advisory group was to make it a lot easier. Um, when we did the project with the University of Sunshine Coast, it was challenging, uh, but at the same time there were a lot of learnings to that. It took us quite a few months to organise all those state authorities, particularly with the fish habitat areas. Um, I'll throw to Craig to talk in details on how he's working with state agencies at the moment. Yes, I'm working with the state agencies, with the managers who will actually provide advice on the conditions on the permits at the moment to give advice on how best to proceed. Um, they're at a cutting edge space that at a state level, they're re trying to revise the state policy on restoration because they don't have a policy. Um, yet they're being challenged on a number of fronts, not just here in Noosa, about how to proceed at a state government level with restoration and integrate it under the various pieces of legislation that it impacts. So we're um, in that space as well. So. The agency is changing its headspace on how it deals with these permits sort of weekly as we discuss more about how we can develop a better policy to make this easier. But as it stands without the policy in place, it's a very complicated process because there isn't a very clear cut procedure. We have four or five different permits we have to acquire and the conditions placed in those permits are highly variable and depends on the individuals assessing the applications on the day. So. 
we have a quite a body of work of finding out who those individuals are and working directly with them to help them understand the project and what we're doing so that they don't put unrealistic conditions on us. It's my view, Mayor, that for the last project, some what I thought were fairly unreasonable conditions were placed on the local government in terms of responsibilities and signage and a bunch of things that became quite difficult to manage as a project and costly as well because the state wasn't too sure what to do with a restoration project. Their thinking on restoration has evolved a bit even since then and we're hoping that the conditions they put on the permitting will at least be much simpler but it's quite a journey to get them. It could take 12 to 18 months simply because there's so many people who get consulted. So when you say costly, is that then incurred as, as, as a as, a, as an additional cost to the contract or is that all within the contract itself? Is that all accounted for? The costs are within the contract, but what I'm talking more about is the liability. Who's liable for issues that may arise with fishing, for example, or something. And that's what the state got quite prickly last time. And I'm trying to work with the state to try and calm them down a bit to make them not so cautious about how they permit a project in an area that they're not used to dealing with. So, so if there are liability issues, are we at risk as a council? I mean, we need to maintain insurance. We maintained insurance for the previous project as well. Um, so like, like anything, I mean, if we initiate a project that involves a change in structure in the bottom of the river, then you know there, there's a risk there and a need to carry insurance to cover that risk. Um, the degree of risk is to an extent determined by the state through their permitting processes. And obviously quite subjective then, from what you're saying. Yeah, it's a negotiation to some point because we're working in a space that's not standard government business. It's a new area of business for the government of this state. And they will, and we will also have been connecting them up to other states which are more progressed in the restoration space to get guidance, for example, in Victoria, New South Wales or Western Australia. In South Australia, we've done more in this space than the Queensland government. So it's an unknown as to how much liability we could be exposed to. We saw, we look at the permit conditions from the last round and we can see how far it can go. And I would definitely say that our liability this time would be less, simply because we're working much closer with the agency with this project. We're also working with the Nature Conservancy and we're working also with the state government directly. We're not in an adversarial relationship with the state, we're actually treating it as a partnership project with the state, so that their goodwill helps us make it, the conditions for this kind of work easier and that we benefit from that here at a local level as well. That's why we've been very careful that the people we've selected for our tag are people who are in the places of positions of authority who are advising these things and so that they understand what we're doing and that they're less likely, therefore, to put onerous conditions on us. So we're trying to ameliorate risk by our engagement. Okay, we've got one more question from Councillor Jury. Right, my understanding is there's already a, a, a oyster restoration project in Port Bay and or uh, the Bribey Passage. Correct. Does that help facilitate some of the uh, concerns of the state because there's already a project that has been approved? Um, it certainly has put pressure on the state to consider this more seriously. There is a lot of interest in restoration within the state and of course around the country. Um, it's an area that's developed quite radically, rapidly over the last 10 years and a lot of the science to support restoration has moved a long way um, in, within Australia I mean. and so there is a lot of interest. The way it's happened elsewhere, for example, Palmerstone Passage is that private organisations have approached the government for permits and it's got rather adversarial at times, I would suggest, um, but also the state has forced the state to consider this issue more seriously. Our project is different because we're taking a partnership approach with the state and so we're getting a lot more buy-in from the state in the way we a bit do more, A bit more of a collaborative understanding. That's right. And my understanding is also like 20 current projects around the country in this sphere in other states, is that...? I think collectively between the private organisations and the TNC work, yes. Do we have the paperwork of partnership scales. with the state? Mm -hmm. Do we have the paperwork? We don't have a formal relationship with the state, but I think we should drive towards an MOU or something in this space. I think it's something worth further discussion, um, but the council hasn't considered it, and I think I'll leave it to Craig to comment on any thoughts are gone along those lines in the past. So when we talk about, so partnership is not, a, you don't, sorry, I'm just confused when you say we've got a partnership with the state. Is that a no, formal document you, that we have signed? I, I think we're talking, more, approach. we're talking more about an approach, approach in the sense that we have the state sitting on a technical advisory group on the earlier stages of the project. So yeah. rather than us being a private person going say, here's what we want to do, approve it or not, we're actually working with key people from the departments who okay. authorise the permits right. At right now. So okay. so we're basically working with them. Taking them on a journey. So, so, 
So I was yeah. under the assumption you meant we had another signed document no, with an no, about partnership. No, it would be nice. But right. No, no, okay. I just have so it's just a general term. Yeah. Right. Craig, I just have a question about that then. So on page 32 when you're talking about partnerships, you've got a department and environment science to be confirmed. Mm -hmm. So are you able to clarify? Um, up to this date, um, Des does not see it has a direct role in the Noosa River because there's no national park here, for example. But they have to initial permit for um, putting things in the river, but it's not. they don't see it as a critical part of their core work. So they're happy to be an advisory body on the side and liaise with us in an informal way. And they've nominated a um, one of their senior permit officers to talk with me. But I'm actually encouraging to sit directly on the tag and we're still working to get a position for the tag. And I've made, we've made some representation to Des to get a person, but they have not been forthcoming yet, but we're still working because I would definitely like them at the table on the tag in a more formal sense. Because um, they will so be a concurrent agency. The question there is that, you're talking to regional officers of this or to regional but now we're going to a much much higher level okay. mm -hmm. um craig on the membership for the technical advisory group is there an opportunity to invite community representatives and in particular can we invite um, families from historical commercial fishing families to sit on um, on, on the, in the group given that I believe that they would provide valuable, independent, um, historic input into the project. Look, that information sounds fantastic, and I know that some of that has already been captured, but I'd like to capture more of it. The TAG's not necessarily the best place to do that. Um, you know, there's a range of subgroups that meet informally around this project already, um, international groups that I sit with, and also bilateral meetings I have with people to gather information. So there's many forums. The TAG is a TNC sort of construct to advise me on getting through the critical work. And that critical work is the permitting. It was probably the most important aspect. Um, other kinds of information that helps us build a stronger project with better community support. There are multiple avenues. And my first avenue is always to go to a bilateral. And then if it warrants more people involved, then we can establish something or have a, some, a special event to capture that information if it needs to be more public. But broadening the group makes it unwieldy as a group to manage for me. I'm one individual doing this whole project and I have to do a lot of um, administration already. And so we we'll just look for a more, most efficient way to do that. It starts with the bilaterals and take the people directly and, and engage them. And then if there's a need for something else, we can. But for setting up another committee structure, it starts being a lot more for me to actually administer as well. And I'm concerned about that. Um, as not being efficient for any of us really to do it that way. The, yeah, that's probably the key to it. Sorry, Craig, so the technical advisory group, the TAG, is the people who are on that are chosen by the Nature Conservancy. Correct. How many people are on that? What have we got at the moment? Um, sorry, know. it's in the report. Um, uh, they're chosen by the Nature Conservancy in partnership with council. Um, at the moment, Outside of uh, Council and Nature Conservancy membership, we have seven nominated representatives, five of which attended the first meeting. We've already spoken about Carby Carby and Des, who are unable to attend. So bearing in mind that it is a partnership agreement between Council and the Nature Conservancy, is there the capacity, as Council Lawrenson suggested, for us as a Council to have a representation on that group in the form of potentially some fishing families from the community? I'd have to go back and talk to TNC about that. It's not a community stakeholder group. It's a technical group for a different purpose. However, um, if the council is interested in doing that, then we could bring a proposal to TNC and I could take it to the TNC hierarchy. It does change the nature of the group. It makes a, the conversations different because it's not a stakeholder reference group. It's an internal working group. Um, if it's going to be politicised as a group, then we'll need to talk more generally about the terms of reference for that group, I would suggest. And so uh, I think we're getting to the point of questions being posed that are really advocacy for a position, so I'm going to call that concession to a halt. Um, I think we need, as a, 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 a council, decide uh, whether we want to respect international scientific opinion about what what should be on a technical advisory group or whether we want to play with it as a group. Well, I think there should be a little latitude there because we're coming so to this we with, with, no, with new eyes and so we're, we're not abreast of this. So I think the sure. questions I'm, I'm are not, I'm not, I'm not discounting your, your point of view. I'm just saying 
because we're using questions to make a point rather than just finding any information, I think the best place for that is at the general committee so that other councillors who are not part of this committee can have a, a, a similar view or an alternative view discussed. So, that's all. I'm happy to have an alternative view discussed at another meeting if that's what you like, but I do think that it is, community needs to be um, involved at some capacity. We're not sure what that is yet. We're new kids on the block in these roles and we're just trying to make sure there is equitable voice at the table for the community as well, who at the moment, there are a lot of issues around them feeling disengaged. Sure. Yeah, and um, this is a question, not uh, an excuse to make a statement through a question. Um, Craig, peer review assessment, is that, um, I'm, I've only read somewhere again in all the documentation that the, the um, the reports will be peer reviewed. Can yeah. I ask who appoints the, the that person? Uh, the peer review reports, where TNC produces any sort of scientific documentation, it sends it out to the wider restoration community internationally, which is a range of private institutions, universities, with experts who have been working in this field for their commentary and feedback before reports are generally finalised. And often from our reports, the standard the TNC operates at, usually scientific papers also become part of the products because the, the standards are kept at a very high level. TNC, um, as a not-for-profit organisation, um, has at its core a scientific foundation. And so it's, it sets a very high standard for itself and for the communities of professionals with whom it works to hold each other to account for their standards. And TNC Australia program does the same, and that's why we invite by international critique of um, our technical work. Okay. Well. So would someone like to move the motion that it be referred to general committee? Move Councillor Stewart and second Councillor Wigner. All in favour? <coughs> Pass. We move on to the Ringtail Mural project. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Castle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think you get a job there in the Simon Craig of Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I suppose um, the author of the report's already sitting at the table, so we don't have to invite him. I do, you know, councillors, um, that Noosa District Landcare are mentioned in the report. Uh, as a, um, a group that's already contributed to this project and there is potential that they may do so in the future. So as a cautionary measure, I do wish to restate um, my the potential for a perceived conflict of interest um, in this matter. Um, due to the fact that as a sole trader in my business, Fortitude Australia, I have both been contracted by and have subcontracted with the Noosa District Land Care prior to becoming a councillor. I'm also an ordinary member of the group with long-standing association, um, including as council representative that assisted in its foundation in 1989. Um, I've had long-standing collegial relationships dating back to that time uh, with uh, current members of the, the, the management committee of the group um, in both my professional roles and state government uh, roles. Um, and through those roles and his relationship with members of the that's what I've said. Um, I'd further advise that prior to me becoming company, I undertook a paid two-day consultancy, facilitating a meeting of Landcare members in 2015, and also subcontracted with Landcare for a project, which is similar to what I said before. Council advised there was, yeah, that, that, there's no nexus between that work and the current project, although I do wish to declare that some people may perceive the interest and therefore I wish to uh, declare that I think I can uh, deal with this item impartially in the public interest and request to remain in the meeting room to participate in debate and vote on the matter. And on the chairman's vote. So councillors, it's um, just for information, once a chairperson declares a conflict, unless it's a council meeting, at a council meeting automatically the deputy mayor takes over, um, but at committee meetings it's up to the committee to decide uh, who's going to chair the meeting for the purpose of considering Councillor Stockwell's declaration. So if we need uh, one of the other three councillors um, to volunteer <laughs> to chair the meeting um, to consider the, the declaration issue, and then once that's been dealt with, 
um, depending on what the outcome is, the uh, councillor Stockwell will then resume the chair chairmanship of the meeting. So um, what I'd ask is that if any of the councillors would like to volunteer to chair the meeting to consider the conflict of interest question, um, then we can obviously throw that up. So um, if one of the other councillors would like to nominate Councillor Stewart to chair the meeting. Yep, so Councillor Wegner has nominated Councillor Stewart to chair the meeting and Councillor Finzel has seconded that. So all those in favour of that motion? Done. If you're allowed to vote. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, that's passed. So for the purpose of considering this matter, uh, Councillor Stewart will now chair the meeting. And uh, if you'd like any advice, I'll give you that advice thank as well. You, so. Thank you. Would anyone have any questions? Does anyone have any questions to Councillor Stockwell? In regard to his perceived conflict of interest, uh, we we actually went through this, you know, yep. exhaustively <laughs> uh, last month. So uh, I have I have no further no questions that which have been already been answered by by Brian. And probably my observation, just my advice to council would be: at the last round of meetings, when you considered this, it was considering a grant directly from council to Landcare. In this particular case, in this report, there is no financial consideration being provided from Council for Landcare. It is simply that Landcare have done work for a third party on this site. I don't have any questions. Do you um, I don't have any questions. Thank you for bringing that to our attention that the last discussion was based to a grant. Um, and as long as there's no financial benefits to be gained by Council of Stockwell at this time, I'm happy to proceed. So the way, from a council perspective, um, you need to do two things, is it a real or perceived conflict of interest, and, and um, if you seek my advice, it would be a perceived conflict yep. of interest, and then you can choose whether Councillor Stockwell can remain in the meeting or must leave the meeting, and one of the councillors could move a resolution okay. on those lines. So I move a motion that um, Councillor Stockwell may remain in the, in the room. Um, all in favour? I just okay. need a second if that Oh, well. second, sorry. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Councillor Wigner, Kylie, all in favour? Councillor Stockwell, back to you. Thank you. <laughs> and just before we go off that, it is always a wise thing for a councillor. That was I gave advice to Councillor Stockwell that was probably marginal about whether or not to make that declaration. Yeah. But when in doubt, I always say to Councillor, yeah. make the declaration. When in doubt, shout out. When in doubt, <laughs> shout out. <and>, yeah. <laughs> so, have anyone got questions or wish further information on this topic to be brought to Monday's meeting? Would you like me to speak just very briefly? Uh, Councillor, just a bit of background for this one. I, I try and do a report once a year on this you know, quite significant project. Um, the project kicked off in 2017 with some negotiations which came to fruition in 2018 with, with contracts and agreements. Um, and in this particular report, uh, because we have a number of new councillors, I've actually gone back and revisited the, that journey, if you like, from an MOU into contracts in 2018 and then um, the update in 2019. Perhaps the only difference in this year's update is that we are looking at making a good project even better in terms of whether we can do more remediation work on that site um, using a proposal that's come through from Greenfleet and I'll set out the details on that. Maybe I can go through those in a bit more detail on, on Monday if there's, unless there's any questions in the meantime. It's quite a complex and uh, long history of this, um, probably the most com complex tenure issue I've ever dealt with. Um, but the, yeah, the report sort of tries to go through a lot of that history and, and provide an update on where all the activity is at the moment and look at a pathway forward to get even a better outcome. Yeah. It, what um, the person in charge, I understand, is you, Brett, the, the, how you managed to bring the HQ Plantations, Department of Agriculture and Fisheries, the Department of the Environment and Science, Noosa Parks Association, and the Noosa, Coun Noosa Council together to, to, to and be, be, with the um, HQ Plantations being an international organization. Wow, what, what, a, what a, um, an example of great leadership and foresight to actually put this together, because the more I learn about it, the more difficult it and impossible it would have seemed in the beginning. I, um, I have to pay tribute to the former CEO now of HQ Plantations. Um, they were very, very good to deal with as a corporate citizen. They have certain um, environmental principles they were trying to, to incorporate into their organisation. And the, the day that he said, yeah, I think we can do this, was the day that it started to happen. It couldn't have happened without him. Um, but yeah, lots of other parties there involved as well. 
to say that the opportunity <coughs> for such a partnership was presented to council from within the community, rather than from, our, from within the organisation of council. So the, uh, all the partners involved have had a, a, a very strong strategic and uh, view in this regard. I, I just like to comment that it may be the most beneficial morning tea I've ever had at a conference. Uh, in fact, before the CEO got the phone call from Greenfleet, I ran to the CEO after over morning tea at the coastal conference, and at that stage, the whole ringtail era was just a fairly nebulous concept in terms of where we might be heading. And um, said, "Why don't you give the CEO a ring? And so if we get four million dollars out of it, we're well worth a chat." Are there any other questions or other information that council would like before Monday? All good? Yeah, all good. So I'll move the motion that it be referred to the General Committee for further discussion, considering the significance of the matter. Is that what we're doing? Second. And a seconder. Second. And for the Fizzle, I'll go with, and all in favour? Unanimous. And